Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Elon Musk's recent presentation at Starbase Texas was, I think, a little more interesting than some may have given it credit for. In their raw form, perhaps they can come off a little dry. Well, surprise, because my good friend Adam editing along with us here on the channel just couldn't wait to present this in a way that absolutely blew my mind. I would have put this up earlier, but there has been so much going on that I wanted to make sure that we picked the right time. Well, that is now, and I am really wanting to hear what your opinion is of this, because to me, as we dream of the near future to come, this is an amazing example of why I, well, why we love this story so much. As we patiently await the upcoming Integrated Flight Test 3, you can't help but feel that anticipation growing. I just cannot wait. Anyway, sit back, pop on the headset, and enjoy. Hey, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. <laughs> I've been very closely involved with the Starship program from the beginning. Like, I lived out here, this is my primary residence for three years. This used to be a sandbar, basically, what we're looking at here. And now it's got a, an advanced rocket factory and a gigantic launch pad and we've got a whole bunch of rockets out there. But I'm still amazed that it actually got put together and it took off. I'm like, wow. I think it's incredible that we took off twice last year. But that first launch did take a, take a while to get off the pad. It's a bit worried there for a second. And then between flight one and two, we made a number of massive upgrades. There was obviously a massive upgrade to the launch pad. So we've got like our many Niagara Falls here. I mean, the, the water pressure is so much that if it went straight up, it would actually destroy the rocket. That's how much water pressure it is. And it worked. Like, I actually went and looked at, one of the first things I went and looked at after second launch was to check out the launch pad. Because after the first launch, we dug a pretty big hole. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and honestly, it looked like there was no damage at all. Like the, you could just launch again, basically, for the pad itself. So it's great work by the team to radically improve the launch pad overnight. Yeah. There are actually so many upgrades between flight one and two that would actually take like hours to go through them all. But one of the biggest upgrades was going from hydraulic to electric actuation of the engines. So that actually saved a lot of mass and complexity. We also massively upgraded the heat shield. The engines themselves were massively upgraded. Literally everything on the rocket, like there might have been thousands of upgrades between flight one and two. I mean, hot staging was, was a change that was basically, I don't know, just really within a space of like three or four months, maybe less, going from uh, previously just kind of like a separating the rocket without anything <laughs> to actually lighting the upper stage engines while the first stage engines are still thrusting and not blowing up the ship. That was an amazing achievement. So I was like, wow, that's, and it worked. So yeah, hot staging. Um, so really gigantic improvement between flight one and two and also obviously many improvements between flight two and three. Flight two actually almost made it to orbit. Um, if, um, if it had had a payload, it would have made it to orbit because the reason that it actually didn't quite make it to orbit was we vented the liquid oxygen and the liquid oxygen ultimately led to fire and an explosion. We wanted to vent the liquid oxygen because we normally wouldn't have that liquid oxygen if we had a payload. <laughs> so ironically, if it had a payload, it would have reached orbit. So I think we've got a really good shot of reaching orbit with Flight 3 and then a rapid cadence to achieve full and rapid reusability. With Flight 1, the goal was not to blow the pad up and ideally get some distance, which we did. With Flight 2, it was to get past staging. So we achieved the goal of getting past staging and almost to orbit. And then Flight 3, we've got, uh, well, we want to get to orbit and we want to do an in-space engine burn from the header tank and prove the, that we can reliably deorbit. We want to do a tipping point a header to main a propellant transfer. This is important for the NASA Artemis program. And uh, we want to also demonstrate the payload door for world's biggest PES dispenser, the sort of dispenser for delivering the really giant Starlink satellites to orbit. And we do hope to do this uh, by the end of this year. And then we've got a whole development plan to, like I said, ultimately get to a fully reusable rocket that does over 200 tons to orbit on a regular basis, full reusability. 
And when I, I tell people, like, yeah, we're going to catch the largest flying object ever with giant mechanical arms, they're like, there's no way that's real. And then we're also going to build a second tower. We're going to really be launching a lot, and we're going to be upgrading one tower while we launch from another tower, so two towers is important. This is a big rocket, um, and it will get uh, bigger over time. I mean, the a Starship is uh, more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V. It is by far the biggest flying object ever made. For, you know, with, with some upgrades down the road, it'll, it'll actually be, I think, probably over 20 million pounds of thrust, and Saturn V is seven and a half. So it'll end up being three times the thrust of Saturn V. And we've got a, a sort of a version two ship uh, that will be more reliable, better performance, endurance. We've got a version three ship design that will be even taller, <laughs> probably end up being, I don't know, 140 meters before it's all said and done, maybe 150 in the end. So it'll be even taller <laughs> than it currently is. And it's gonna fly a lot. It has to fly a lot. So it's, it's gonna end up flying several times a day from many different locations in the world. So we also wanna demonstrate uh, on-orbit refilling. This is uh, very important for the NASA Artemis program. So we're very proud to be part of the NASA Artemis program. I'm always in incredibly grateful to NASA for their support and for trusting us to take astronauts to orbit, to take cargo to the space station, and to be an integral part of getting astronauts back to the moon. In order to go and land on the moon, one of the technical challenges we have to solve is uh, orbital refilling. The Starship's dock on orbit and transfer propellant. We have a lot of expertise in docking, so I'm confident we will solve this, and we just ideally want to solve it hopefully by the end of this year, uh, but certainly by, uh, by next year. And that, that's a big deal. This is one of the fundamental technologies that's necessary to build a city on Mars and to have a moon base. And then more about the NASA human landing system. As I said, we're extremely grateful to NASA for entrusting us with a fundamental part of the Artemis program. Um, we want to make sure we do a great job for NASA. In order for the Artemis program to succeed, we must succeed with, uh, with Starship. And um, like I said, we actually want to far exceed what NASA has asked us to do. So we want to go far beyond the NASA requirements and actually be able to put enough payload on the moon with enough frequency that you could actually have a permanently occupied moon base. That's the next really big threshold from Apollo, uh, is to have an actual moon base. This is the long-term goal. This is what we want Mars to look like, is starships coming and going, an incredible, beautiful Mars city, and a flourishing civilization on Mars. You know, ultimately, we can transform Mars into an Earth-like planet with uh, terraforming. It just needs to be warmed up, really, and then it could be ultimately an Earth-like planet, and we could bring the life from Earth to Mars. And really, it's, it has to be, has to be humans, because uh, it's not gonna be the dolphins. We can bring all the creatures with us, and we can ensure that life on Earth continues on Mars even after Earth becomes unlivable in the distant future. Yeah, we just gotta get it done before civilization ends, but, but I, like, I, think we, I think it's gonna happen. Kind of the mind-blowing thing is, like, there is an actual path that we are on to make life multi-planetary. Now, I get asked a lot about aliens, actually, and I usually say I am one. But the truth is, I actually have not seen any evidence of aliens. So, that leads me to think that we're more likely to be a tiny candle of consciousness in a vast emptiness, a vast darkness. The civilization that we have is really just this very, very small candle in a vast darkness, and we just must do everything possible to ensure that that candle does not go out. So, what did you think of that? When I watched this for myself for the first time, it took my breath away a little. Again, a big, big thank you to Adam for putting that together. Thanks as well, of course, to the amazing patrons, the members and subscribers that let us make these sorts of videos for you as an actual job. We don't just love rockets, spacesuits, and space stations just for the sake of it. It's about that fire inside that screams for adventure, for finding out new things about the great unknown, and to make all of our lives better together. Just the technology that stems from this industry is so impactful that many don't even comprehend how our lives have already been changed so drastically just because of it. 
Looking up, for me, it just seems like that boundless void that almost dares us to dream bigger and to ask those tough what-if questions, to feel a part of something unimaginably gigantic as we all remember that, hey, we are all made of that same star stuff. I truly hope that you enjoyed this video and thank you as always for checking your subscribed here to continue following this Starship saga with us. If you want to continue with more, here's a selection of deep dive videos that explore the potential uses and applications for the world's most powerful rocket. Appreciate you watching here all this way through as always and I'll see you all in the next video.